Designing Freedom. Tonight, Ideas presents the fifth of the 1973 Massey Lectures by Professor Stafford Beer. The future that can be demanded now is the title of Dr. Beer's talk tonight. Efficiency does not entail tyranny, writes Stafford Beer. If we can get the system right, to do so is a top priority because some version of efficiency is required to save our dinosaur society. Freedom, he has argued in these lectures, is not lost by accident, but is the output of a system. To produce freedom as an output, we must redesign the system. It is the blueprint of this system that Stafford Beer has offered us in these lectures called Designing Freedom, which he continues with the future that can be demanded now. How can we dismantle bureaucracy? How can we provide autonomy for people and communities? Where do we find the freedom to invent the future rather than maintaining our passive reliance on forecasting and futurology? Stafford Beer. A famous summit conference, not to say confrontation, about freedom once occurred about 20 miles from my home in England. It lasted from the 15th to the 23rd of June in the year 1215. During those negotiations between King John and his barons, the Magna Carta was signed, a document that spoke for all time of the decentralization of power and of the rights of individuals, and is still much quoted 750 years later. I remember from my boyhood a humorous monologue explaining these events, which ended something like this. So it's thanks to that Magna Carta that was signed with the barons of old that in England today we can do as we like, as long as we do what we're told. The blatant contradiction embodied in this joke remains the desperate problem that it has always been. How do we sustain individual liberty and societal cohesion at the same time? It's right that this problem should be incessantly discussed, and it is discussed. But the discussion always seems to lead straight into the same disastrous trap, a false dichotomy between the notions of centralization and decentralization. The vehemence with which this matter is debated is extraordinary, because the most cursory consideration of what constitutes a viable system reveals how false the dichotomy must be. For example, if you personally were a fully centralized system, you would need to remember to tell your heart to beat. If you paid too much attention to what I'm saying and forgot, you would collapse on the floor. That would be dramatic, but it's not what I'm trying to achieve with you. But if you were a fully decentralized system, you would trot off from this broadcast to investigate any sound. Neither solution would leave you a viable system for long. Let's analyze the blend of central and peripheral command and see what happens. We discovered earlier that viable systems are bombarded continuously with high variety stimuli, the variety of which has to be attenuated if the system is not to be overloaded. The attenuation must be done according to a pattern, if it's not merely an arbitrary discard. If that pattern is to have survival value, which is a necessity for a viable system, then it must be a regulatory model of whatever is regulated. Then it follows that this has to be a central function for the system, because only the system as a whole can have a model of its own relationship with its own environment. Nonetheless, when the central function of variety attenuation is operating, it is, by definition, not appropriating to itself the discarded variety. But by Ashby's law, we know that variety must be absorbed somewhere. Therefore, whatever variety is not appropriated by the central function must needs be handled by a decentralized function. This variety handling is by definition autonomous. That's to say that some part of any viable system does what it likes. But of course the autonomous part of the system remains part of the system. 
and to do that it must take notice of the central regulatory model. To that extent, then, it does what it's told. If we make a terrible mess of interpreting these simple cybernetic discoveries in our society, and I feel that we do, it's because there is no agreed machinery for settling clearly which parts of the system are which. To do so is indeed virtually impossible unless the models in question are made explicit for each level of recursion. To remind ourselves, a level of recursion is a level at which a viable system is in operation as an autonomous part of a higher level viable system and containing within itself parts which are themselves autonomous viable systems. We spoke of this setup before as being like a set of Chinese boxes. We find the process of settling autonomy going on continuously within any viable family, for example. As the children grow older, they exert more and more their personal freedom of action. But this has to fit into the family's general regulatory model at a higher level of recursion. Thus a great deal of time will be spent in discussing the notion of autonomy for the younger members. And the time required has to be a great deal because requisite variety must be attained. In the upshot, families often manage to preserve their model of the family, which is centralising, and the liberty of the younger people, which is decentralising, and forget altogether to consider the right of freedom for the parents, who then become identified with the centralising authority. This, you will note, is not at all to the parents' advantage, since they have lost freedom in the process, although it may appear to be so to the children. This homely example is repeated with great force in the yet higher levels of societary recursion. A well-intentioned corporation or national service tries to hang on to its systemic policy, because this is what makes it itself, this is what embodies its aims, this structures its regulatory model. But that policy is centralising. Then the corporation and the national service, being well-intentioned, embark on high-variety negotiations with the parts of the system in order to delineate of autonomy, which they really wish to be maximal. But the tools they are using are not cybernetic tools that undertake variety engineering, but administrative tools which do not. As we have several times noticed, bureaucracies install amplifiers in one loop of the homeostat when they should be installing attenuators in the other, and vice versa. The upshot now is really quite strange, but nonetheless extremely common. The parts of the system, subsidiary companies, sectors of the national service, who have been in good conscience given maximum autonomy, believe that they have been totally centralised. This is because their variety is attenuated by wrongly installed central amplifiers. But, on the other hand, the higher management at the centre, in conceding in good conscience maximal autonomy, believes that it has somehow been robbed of any role at all. This is because its variety is over-attenuated by wrongly installed peripheral attenuators. In the family, given quite a lot of hard work, everyone can just about hang on to happiness. But in big institutions, where, we have to remember, the brains of all the men and women involved are still the same size as they are in family roles, disenchantment spreads. I often reflect that our organisations are so constructed in their typically pyramidal shapes so that they could work only if the people in them grew bigger heads as they became more senior. In that case, of course, there would at least be a chance that they could maintain requisite variety. However, as we know, everyone's head is roughly the same size, except perhaps metaphorically. I also reflect upon the device whereby decentralisation is often advocated as the solution for an institution's problems when it is held to be over-centralised, while centralisation is simultaneously prescribed for another institution on the grounds that it is too diffuse. And I have seen the two policies advocated alternately, and what is more, alternately adopted for the same institution by successive groups of consultants. It's a kind of managerial madness. It leads, as it can only lead, to exacerbated oscillations in the system's search for stability. The solutions lie, they can only lie, in good variety engineering, 
And here is the key point. We mustn't confuse the pattern of the regulatory model with its specific content. It's enough to attain requisite variety by specifying the pattern. To specify the content is too much. Yet this is what endlessly happens. And I have noted that it usually happens in those well-intentioned institutions in good conscience for one fundamental reason. This is called fairness. But I believe this kind of fairness to be an excuse for avoiding responsibility. Take the example of a big institution that has a salary policy or an employee automobile policy or an inventory policy. We need a way of saying what the policy, which is to say the variety attenuating regulator model or pattern, really is without specifying its specific content. We fail. We ought to say this much can be spent on salaries, on automobiles, on inventories, and leave it to managers at lower levels of recursion to apportion the money. Instead, we do the variety engineering in the wrong place. This is the salary scale. You are entitled by your job to this range of automobiles. All inventories must be cut by 10%. It's done, as I said, in the name of fairness, but that is delusory. It's nonsense to say that two men of the same age, with identical qualifications, with identical commitments, are necessarily worth the same wage. Obviously not. One may be useless, and the other a paragon. It's nonsense to say that my job ought somehow to determine my needs where automobiles are concerned. How and where I live, how many children I must push into the automobile, these are my own affair. It's nonsense to penalise a good manager who works on a scientifically calculated minimal inventory because his colleague managers are inefficiently tying up the firm's capital. This is a recipe to encourage inefficient managers. Why do we blandly accept so much nonsense? The variety of attenuators to use here are not policy documents from the centre, but the managers themselves. That's what managers are for. As to the criterion of fairness, the manager, or any individual in whatever he does, ought to be ready to take responsibility for his own decisions. Our society militates against that morality, for that's what it is, with all its force, in the name of an efficiency, which is thoroughly bad cybernetics, in the name of a fairness, which is manifestly unfair. But please remember the precept. Each of us should take responsibility for his own acts. The practice is precisely the contrary. As usual, then, we have the amplifiers and attenuators on the wrong side of the equation. But all of this is now written into our culture, all of this is now underwritten by our bureaucratic formulae. That is why I've repeatedly argued that fundamental change in our modes of organisation is essential. Merely to juggle with existing forms simply increases the swing of the oscillating pendulum that never can find its stable state. And, as I've mentioned before, this means that the system is robbed of the crucial reference point without which it cannot learn, cannot adapt, cannot evolve. How do we set about making so fundamental a change as would bring our ways of working into line with the scientific rules of this game? To answer this question, it's necessary to understand the nature of resistance to change. Here's a phrase that is on everybody's lips. There is resistance to change. But it's a phrase which is not analysed according to the principles of effective organisation. People seem to imagine that they are confronted with a psychological hang-up, insofar as men and women are not supposed to like change. But pause one moment. Is that true? People consider as individuals, it seems to me, like change rather a lot. Don't you get bored when nothing changes? I know I do then just why do we go around saying that there is a resistance to change? Of course, the answer's simple. It's not the living, breathing human who resists change in his very soul. The problem is that the institutions in which we humans have our stake resist change. Therefore, we feel as individuals that we can't afford to embrace it. And this is an extremely sound argument. If you have spent a lifetime working your way up a ladder, you literally can't afford to be robbed of the prizes when your turn comes to collect them.
One of my earliest experiences in industry was to listen to managers explaining to senior operatives that they were to be deprived of their lifetime's ambitions because the whole technology of their process was to be changed. That was in the steel industry, in which the skills of a first-hand melter, a job that it took a lifetime to learn, were replaced in a year by clever instrumentation. But ten years later, those same managers were themselves confronted by the computer, which would have made many of their skills redundant in turn. However, managers have power, and the computer none. It was easier to misuse the computer than to accept the institutional change, because the consequences would have been quite personal. Now I have come to what I consider to be the explanation of the abuse of science and technology in our society. The power has remained where it resided. The tools of modern men have been disregarded at this level of recursion. And there is no one left to say a loud no to that until the people themselves say no. So this is why I contend that we are considering a future that can be demanded now. Every time we hear that a possible solution simply cannot be done, we may be sure on general scientific grounds that it can. Every time we hear that a solution is not economic, we ought to ask, for whom? Since it's people, just people, who will have to pay. Every time we hear that a proposal will destroy society as we know it, we should have the courage to say, Thank God, at last. Whenever we hear that it will destroy our freedom, we should be very cautious indeed. For such freedom as we have is our most treasured possession, and we know how to be vigilant. Yet for that very reason, this is the simplest method that the powerful have to cling to power, to convince people that any other concession of that power would be unsafe. But I would like to stop philosophizing to you about all this at the expense of introducing another technical term. We haven't had one for a couple of lectures, and I hope the very few that I have introduced make a useful vocabulary. We are by now used to the notion that institutions are not just entities with certain characteristics. They are instead dynamic, viable systems, and their characteristics are in fact outputs of their organizational behavior. The variety that, that is pumped into them is absorbed by regulating variety through an arrangement of amplifiers and attenuators, a system that, through this kind of exercise in requisite variety, achieves stability against all perturbations, is called a homeostat. A homeostat can resist perturbation not only against expected disruption, but against unexpected disruption too. For this reason, it is not only stable, but ultra-stable. Whatever happens to it, provided that its relaxation time is sufficiently short, it will not go into oscillation, and still less will it explode in catastrophic instability. The sign of this homeostasis, now so deficient in our major institutions, and perhaps, as I said last time, even in ourselves, is that critical outputs of the system are held steady. Why produce this extra terminology at this late stage? It's because I want to answer the question about resistance to change in a very precise way. All homeostatic systems hold a critical output at a steady level, but some of them have a very special extra feature. It is that the output they hold steady is their own organization. Hence, every response that they make, every adaptation that they embody in themselves, and every evolutionary maneuver that they spawn is directed to survival. So this special trick rather well defines the nature of life itself. It also rather well explains why we cannot change our institutions very easily. The systemic organization is directed not primarily to our welfare, but to their own survival. At this point, we need to draw a very careful distinction. Institutions are supposed to be homeostatic. They have been driven away from this behavior by getting their relaxation times out of phase with explosive change. That was the argument. 
Yet buried inside the institution is a nucleus which retains its homeostasis by ignoring not only external change, but the primary function of the institution itself. This nucleus is the special kind of homeostat that produces itself. And it is this nucleus that I call the bureaucracy. By this term I am not simply referring to paper pushing, but to an institution within the institution that exists, narcissus-like, in self-regard. Bureaucrats assimilate the challenge of explosive change in essentially bogus fashion. For many years I used to make the joke that they would accept every kind of change, provided it involved no actual alteration. Indeed, I used that very phrase, but not jocularly, in the third lecture. In any case, the joke rebounded. Bureaucracies do accept change. They do this by acknowledging novel conditions. They are not so stupid as to pretend that such conditions haven't occurred. But what changes they make are superficial, and they are made so that the organization, which is what makes the system the system that it is and no other, is completely preserved. Thus, there is no actual alteration, although appearances may have changed a great deal. When this is generally understood, it will no longer be possible to fob people off with unreal changes masquerading as real alterations. Until then, our institutions will go on producing the social benefits of their activities simply as byproducts of their major bureaucratic undertaking, which is to produce themselves. According to the analysis of centralization and decentralization with which we began, it's clear that there should be a major devolution of power. I think it should be open to a community to organize its social services, education, health, welfare, exactly as it pleases, and to accept or reject the initiatives of local innovators. I think that goes for the local branches of national undertakings, public and private also. I think that workers should in general be free to organize their own work, and that students, up to the age of death, should be free to organize their own studies. The first barrier to doing any of these things is the absence of money. It's always assumed that because everything has been centralized and because the center makes facilities available, then a community wishing to do its own thing is opting out of the official plan. It may or may not grudgingly be allowed to do so, but it will have to finance itself. Yet the finances that have been raised at the center are raised on behalf of the parts. It's perfectly clear that this is a monstrous infringement of liberty. The question, however, is not so much how do they get away with it, because I continue with the hypothesis that everyone is well-intentioned. The real question is, how did the system degenerate to this unviable form? We have done enough cybernetic thinking about dynamic viable systems by now to draw the distinction that's required to answer this question. In order to maintain viability, the total system must have a central regulatory model. This model ought to be created by democratic consultation, but we can't dodge the truth that it will constrain variety in the parts. Put neutrally like that all remains well for it's essential that variety be attenuated in any case, and it's essential that services which become economic only at the total system recursive level should be made available. But the vital distinction comes here. The precise form of variety attenuation is a matter for local decision. The critical mistake we are making is to take the variety attenuating decisions at the wrong level of recursion then this is how freedom is lost, and this is what induces the instability that threatens to become catastrophic. For the whole system model simply doesn't have requisite variety to balance the local homeostats. They in their turn are robbed of the variety they need to find their own stable points. With this insight, it's possible to redesign any of our institutional systems. In my own experience of trying to do this, two major barriers to progress always appear. The first is that bureaucracy. Bureaucracies build around any centralized system in order to administer its centrality. In decentralizing, 
the need for the bureaucracy disappears. But we are already in the trap. Bureaucracies exist and are powerful. This is obvious enough. What is less obvious is the argument I used just now. They have themselves become viable systems that produce themselves. Now, a parasitic growth depends on its host's continued existence, it's true. But the parasite may flourish at the host's expense. There are two lines of approach to evaluating the facts, and you may try both of them on any institution you like. The first is to count heads. How many people employed are, by these definitions, of the bureaucracy? Official statistics are not collected in a form which will answer that question, either nationally or within corporations. One has to do the measuring oneself, and often it's necessary to divide an individual's use of time between his work for the host and his work for the parasite. There's a lot of room here for self-deception. The answer is often as high as one-third and rising. Then we needn't be surprised that the bureaucracy has taken on a life of its own. The second line of approach is to examine the forms in which the bureaucracy produces itself. For example, how much of the concern shown by the bureaucracy inside health, education and welfare is for patients, students and their deprived, and how much for the cybernetic machinery by which the medical, teaching and social professions produce themselves? People are entitled to ask those questions. In asking them, they should realize that the need to maintain standards is a serious need and also an impregnable excuse. People are further entitled to ask whether there are not other ways of maintaining standards than by having bureaucracies. Of course there are. The trouble is that they would rely heavily on responsibility. On responsibility for one's own acts, on responsibility for one's own colleagues. As we have already seen, this morality is not favoured. It is unfair. Besides, it leaves people unprotected. Far better, then, to have a bureaucracy which is amoral than to depend on the morality of real human beings. How do you find yourself reacting to that? For me, it's indefensible. Then our analysis leads to this clear conclusion. If institutions really are to be changed, then their fundamental organisation really must be altered, and a major component of that alteration will be to dismantle the bureaucracy. Changes which do not dismantle the bureaucracy are unreal. They don't lead to alteration, but to the adaptation of the bureaucracy in continuing to produce itself. You may notice that I have always said that a system of this kind produces itself, and not that it reproduces itself, which sounds more natural. The reproduction follows, which is bad, but it isn't the central point. To have the aim to produce itself is the mark of a system that cannot be dismantled without a death. When we funk the assassination, we may yet ensure much change, but the system lives on unaltered. So it has become with our societary institutions. A little time ago I said that there were two barriers to progress and that the first is bureaucracy. The second is the availability of money. But I've dealt with that question before and need only summarise my answers now. Essentially, the costs associated with major projects are unreal. Point one. They usually represent not the actual costs but the availability of funds. Point two. The availability of funds is divided into arbitrary time epochs which match the requirements of accountancy and not the needs of the people. Point three, the people are paying for the projects anyway, one way or another, but this fact is disguised from them. Point four, there is as yet no way in which the people can decide on which projects their money should be spent. Point five, there is no reason why spending money according to the wishes of the people should cost more than to spend it according to the wishes of the bureaucracy, provided that the central regulatory model has been democratically composed and is properly understood. Point six, and this is new, the cost of many new societary projects could be met from savings made by dismantling the bureaucracy.
So I am hoping that we may approach the final lecture of this series in the following state of mind. The human being is limited by his finite brain from assimilating all possible information and from recognizing all possible patterns of the world. He is limited by his own finite resources from doing whatever he likes and by the finite resources of the planet from demanding an endless growth in material prosperity for all men. Indeed, the pursuit of his own material prosperity, though possible, is not something that the affluent part of the world can any longer maintain as a good, unless it is explicitly willing to declare that it will be done at the expense of the less fortunate. Then the concept of freedom is not meaningful for any person except with immeasurable variety constraints, and the extent to which we have lost freedom is due to loss of control over the variety attenuators, education, publishing, and to the centralization of power at the wrong levels of recursion. This freedom could be reclaimed using the new scientific tools at our disposal, but only if new democratic machinery is established to replace existing bureaucracies. As long as these remain cybernetically organized so as to produce themselves, our society institutions remain set on courses that lead to catastrophic instability. that can be demanded now, the fifth of the 1973 Massey Lectures by Stafford Beer. Stafford Beer is professor of cybernetics at Manchester University, international consultant in the sciences of management and effective organization, poet and author. His five major books relating to the concerns of these lectures are Cybernetics and Management, Decision and Control, Management Science, Brain of the Firm, and Platform for Change. Next week, the final lecture in this series called The Free Man in a Cybernetic World.